And the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Today, the Feast of the Mother of God falls on a Sunday, and we're here, however, every year on this feast day, which is somewhat in contrast to New Year's Day as a global secular holiday, which doesn't have much meaning except for the flipping of a calendar. But this feast gives reason for us to continue celebrating the Incarnation. Yet, there's something about that flipping of the calendar that always still, I'm sure even among us, inspires a fresh start. Out with the old and in with the new. It's a natural perspective and it's an opportunity uh, to think about how we can be renewed and, and grow in Christ. And so as we consider the meaning of this feast, it also gives inspiration for that fresh start that comes from understanding the incarnation. And so what ultimately we're hoping for is that we understand that Jesus came down so that we can look up. Even as Jesus came down through the Blessed Virgin Mary, we're able to learn to look up the way she did, even as she herself pondered these mysteries in her own heart. And so the, as he became a child for us, so we're renewed in our own sonship with God. And so St. Paul, even as Mary pondered these things, these things were, were presented to her in the context of, a, of those who knew the law. Uh, it says here, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And so Mary followed in this context as a good Israelite of, of those who had received the law and one who kept the law very well. There's grace in the law. It's a gift for God's people. But there's also a context of judgment. We needed the law, all humanity, because we're fallen. But it's interesting that the message was given to Mary not by lawyers, not by those who were students of the law, not even by a prophet, but by shepherds. And so we have a new revelation given to all, to all people, especially those who simply are common folk. And that includes us. So she heard these words, she pondered them. But Paul unpacks these words for us in his letter to the Galatians. And so we hear God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem those who were under the law. Now we hear this word a lot in our church readings, in our liturgies, redemption, redeeming. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, what, what did you redeem? I knew we, we redeemed cans for five cents. Uh, but it's actually a word that has a lot of theological import. So I remember explaining this to my young children, realizing that, that this word doesn't, may not make a lot of sense to them, uh, even though they hear it so much. And so we acted this out. I remember this very clearly when my oldest children were seven and eight in our living room in Pennsylvania. And so I had my oldest son uh, get behind some couch cushions, and that was the jail. And he couldn't get out because, because he had offended God. And so then, uh, then Jesus comes along and lets him get out of the prison, ransoms him, as a word related to redeem, uh, lets him go out. He's put in the jail in his place. But then what does the Son of God do? He breaks out of the jail. And so many years later, my children said, you know, I always remembered that. I understood what it meant to be redeemed, to be ransomed, <laughs> to be freed, uh, to regain. Ultimately, what this means is to regain what was lost. We lost our freedom. And so the law teaches us how to, to operate in that context. But Jesus comes beyond that. 
he became what we were so that we can become what he is, even as he himself, unlimited by our humanity, breaks out of the bonds in which we were held. And so he took that humanity from the Blessed Virgin Mary, becoming one of us. So ultimately, we can receive that perspective, that docility, that grace that she had ahead of time. And as we look to the new year, as we look to a new start, what are we looking to do? But to, yes, to reflect the image of God more in his divinity. But even as the Blessed Virgin Mary did in, his, in her humanity, uh, to, to follow after the mother of God, to become a son in the son, to reflect the family likeness of the son of God. And so St. Paul continues, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, so that we might receive adoption as sons. That's what we're offered, is adoption. That's the essence of our redemption to regain what was lost, that as the children of Israel uh, and were, were called children of Israel, but yet they didn't follow through their call. They didn't follow the law as they were called to. They, they even lost that privilege that they were given. And so the redemption has even more import in Christ. St. John Chrysostom says, puts it this way, he states, this is Christos referring to Paul. Here he states two objects and effects of the incarnation. Deliverance from evil and supply of good. Things which none could compass but Christ. They are these. Deliverance from the curse of the law and promotion to sonship. Sons in the Son. If it's hard as women to relate to the idea of sonship, the idea here is that sons in the ancient Near East were the inheritors. Uh, not any son, but the firstborn son. That's what we're given, the status of a firstborn son. So what, in light of this, what would this idea of sonship have meant to the first hearers of this word from Paul, most of them being Jews? Uh, well, the term son of God can refer to Israel considered collectively. And that shows up for the first time in Exodus 4. Out of Egypt I have called my son, referring to all of God's people as his firstborn son. And in addition, it can refer to individual Israelites, but ultimately to the king par excellence, starting as early as the first prophecies looking forward to David, where we read, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And so, not just all of Israel, but the king is, is the, especially the idealized son who represents all of the sons of God. Um, and, and, and this is, gets repeated throughout the Psalms. Psalm 2 coming to mind. But then in the New Testament, we see this idea building on this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So we have an ethic, something to follow up into to reflect that sonship all the more. And so at this time of year, we might be thinking, okay, uh, we want to make resolutions. It's just a natural response. You know, right? how, can I be, how can I be a, a better individual? You know, whether it be, whether you use the word peacemaker or whatever it might be. And often we pursue these things in our own strength. But here in the scriptures, God's giving us something more than our own strength, more than a resolution. He's giving us a status, a status of adoption, privilege. That is simply grace. And so here we have something that goes beyond Old Testament imagery. As, we, as our Lord comes, as, yes, fulfilling that idea of this as the ideal son of Israel, yes, fulfilling that ideal of the Davidic king, but beyond that is this something not previously conceived of among the people of God. And we see this in John's letter, looking at chapter 5, verse 22, where we see how the son has, this son, 
has equality with the Father, broken into the world as in our humanity. The son of the lowly Mary becomes the judge of all. Here's what we read. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. A new conception of what this Son is. Very Son, that it came to a manger announced by not lawgivers, but by mere shepherds. And so, yes, we have this context of the law, which judges. Uh, but without doing away with the law, we have more. And in light of this, I'd like to share with you some words that you may, some of you, I know some of you have, have read over the last few days, which is the words of Pope Benedict XVI as he was anticipating his own death, looking forward to meeting the judge. These words have been circulated recently, uh, but they were actually written by him in 2018 as he considered his frailty, looking forward and and even back then, preparing for his death. Uh, let's hear them in light of the incarnation, in light of the status that we can claim as sons of God. He wrote, in light of the hour of judgment, the grace of being a Christian becomes all the more clear to me. Uh, because he says, quite soon, I shall find myself before the final judge of my life. Even though as I look, back on my long life, I can have great reason for fear and trembling. I am nonetheless of good cheer, for I trust firmly that the Lord is not only the just judge, but also the friend and brother. So that's what it means to become a son in the sun. And so here, St. Paul refers to this idea of the paraclete. And as, as in, our, in our passage here, as we look forward to the, the one who, uh, in our passage, Paul refers to the paraclete, the one who has come to be our advocate. And so picking up on this, Benedict says that this one, our judge, has already suffered for my shortcomings and is thus also my advocate, my paraclete. And so through this Holy Spirit, that is the privilege of what we have as children of God, he continues, in light of the hour of judgment, the grace of being a Christian becomes all the more clear to me. It grants me knowledge and indeed friendship with the judge of my life. And thus allows me to pass confidently through the dark door of death. In this regard, I am constantly reminded of what John tells us at the beginning of the apocalypse. He sees the Son of Man in all his grandeur and falls at his feet as though dead, yet he placing, yet he placing his right hand on him says to him, do not be afraid, it is I. So ultimately, this is what we received, no fear as adopted sons of God. And so, this theme is picked up in a very similar passage to what we just heard today from the Galatians, when Paul writing to the Romans. He says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of sonship when we cry, Abba, Father. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. All of this is a fruit of the incarnation. God became one of us so that we can approach him in faith, transformed by the Spirit to love the things above. And that's why we can cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father, as we, as St. Paul says, so through God you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir. And so ultimately, this comes full circle as we consider how this changes our lives. As we make resolutions, we're not looking at something that we must lift up a heavy burden to bear in our own strength, but the grace of those who have the spirit of sonship flowing through all our deeds. And later this, I'd like to quote for you some words of 
a New Testament theologian by the name of D.A. Carson, and uh, he, he connects the threads fairly well. But the power of the metaphor itself, Son of God, is seen in its greatest power as, like Benedict, look to Jesus in Revelation, he will be my son, and appropriates all of what that means. And so he will be so much like me that there's no longer any possibility of sin or death or corruption or decay or rebellion in the Christian who is thus called son of God. Whether men or women called sons of God because they reflect God as perfectly as finite human beings made in the image of God can. Ultimately what this means is growing to have that grace that was first embodied by the Blessed Virgin Mary. There is no taint, Carson continues. There is no sign of death or decay. The reflection of God is as perfect as it is possible for a finite human being to reflect the infinite God. And so, of course, this is something that we, that we all do imperfectly. As Carson continues, transformed by the gospel and glorification, Yes, imperfectly, but in a way that we measure up to only imperfectly until we are with Jesus forever. So yes, the Son of God came down so that like Mary, we can look up and hope. She pondered these things at first, but she appropriated them. These things were unpacked for us by Paul so that we can own these truths anew. Qualities, yes, that Mary had ahead of time, but that we can look forward to embracing more and more in the new year as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Son of God.